Hello everyone, Tally Ann Farrell here from Board of It and today we're going to be reviewing Dune Imperium, the much hyped deck building worker placement mashup game. The tagline for the game is influence, intrigue and combat in the universe of Dune and we're happy to say that it provides all of those in spades. The game is based on a mix of the series of Dune novels and the much awaited movie. The card art is based on the upcoming movie, but the characters and cards are recreated faithfully from the novels. And if you're not that into the concept of Dune, or if you don't know anything about Dune, or if you didn't like the previous Dune game, I would say you don't have to worry, because it definitely is a game that stands on its own two feet. Uh, it definitely has a lot to give, particularly if you enjoy deck builders and worker placement. And it's a game that has really grown on us and we very much enjoy. Isn't that right, Tally? Okay, so it looks like I have a 10 strength in the combat and you've only got eight, so I win. I've got two VP and that's 10. <laughs> well, hold on, the game's not done yet. I've well. got this end game card that lets me uh, get a VP if I have the most worms in my deck, which I do. And a second VP if I have more worms than any other player. So that's one VP and that's two VP. And I think it's now 11 to 10. I hate this game. Let's jump right in. You'll begin the game with two agents or workers, a unique leader and a starting deck of 10 cards. To take a worker placement action, you have to also discard a card with a matching symbol to the space where you want to send the worker. After paying any prerequisite costs, you can take the action on that space. And if there's anything written or you can gain anything from the gray part of the card you used, you also get that. Once you've run out of workers to put, or if you just don't want to, you'll do what's called a reveal turn, where you will reveal the cards that you haven't played and get any rewards shown on the dark blue section of the card. And if there's values here with a blue border, this just indicates how much influence you have to buy new cards, which lets you upgrade your deck. Each round, combat will also be taking place with different rewards available each turn. Certain spaces let you either put combat cubes into your base or let you move those cubes into the battle and the player with the highest combat value wins. There are certain ways to supplement your value such as the cards that you reveal or special one-time intrigue cards. There are also faction tracks and whenever you take an action with one of them you move up that faction's influence track and if you move high enough there are a few VPs and resources to get as a reward. When a player reaches 10 VP, this means that that round will be the final round and whoever has the most VP at the end of that final round wins. The end of the game can also be triggered if you run out of these combat cards. So what do we like? We like that Dune Imperium is engaging. It combines the different aspects together really well to provide great depth. As a comparison, Loster and Zavarnak does much the same thing but there the mechanics felt basic and somewhat limiting. Here you can get a third agent and take the Mentat to even take a fourth worker placement action. Getting cards is also pretty easy if you work at it and there's more variety. The resource management is also a perfect balance as you can get decent amounts from combat or the spice blows and you can also take an action to trade them. It's tight but it's not limiting. And just looping back around to the cards, uh, the deck is actually quite big and the cards are quite varied. And we'd expect in a game like this that so you'd have a lot of repeats, but it does appear that the vast majority of cards are quite unique. And then this leads to, you know, making each game a little bit different because as you go through the game, you build up your deck. And so the kind of latter half of the game, you, it's, it's going to be unique every time because you have different options available to you. And it's just quite nice to have this different deck each game. And there's also uh, dilemmas that the cards give you because you get something for a reveal turn and often something also for the worker placement turn on the card. You can only use it for one of them 
and you have to decide which, and sometimes it is quite hard in the moment to figure out what's best for you. But, you know, it's just a great little deck of cards and there's often not one that you don't want. And usually your problem is actually when you're buying them at the end of the round, you don't have enough for the really good ones. Now, we're not that experienced with deck builders, so I don't know if this is something you can do in other deck builders, but here we're quite frustrated by the lack of opportunity to exile your cards. Yes, there is a space here, but it costs two spice, which we think is quite excessive for what you get. You can also get cards from the deck that will let you exile cards, but these aren't that common. And so then it becomes a bit of luck, really, if you can exile a card or not. In the first instance, you need two spice, you need a card in your hand that would let you go to that space and it needs to be unoccupied. And in the second instance, you need to have that card in your hand and also at some point buy it from the deck. So it becomes, yeah, it's just a bit lucky. Whereas, you know, in this game, you will start with 10 cards and you could go up to like 30. And what happens is your starting cards will then end up clogging up your deck and your hands. And personally for me, I would much prefer to play a game where in the final couple of rounds, everyone's battling it out with their carefully crafted decks, as opposed to one player losing because they drew a terrible hand in the final round. Moving on to the worker placement, the board is pretty well designed. Most of the spaces are useful, but often the battle to place your worker will happen over the same four or five spaces. It's a pretty cool idea to have three separate spaces for varying levels of spice, plus the fact that any unused spice spaces gain spice for the next round. And for anyone who doesn't know, spice is the most valuable resource. And now we see the worm in its natural habitat, sleeping after a big spice blow. Usually, the worms don't share territory, so it's rare to see two so close together. Make worm! So this means that the spaces that could be considered most valuable will change round to round, which provides interesting decisions for the players. But not all spaces were created equal, because if you can go to the faction spaces, that's where you're going to be going, because they are a huge reservoir of VP. If you move up two influence with the faction, you get a VP. If you move up another two and you're the first person to do so, you get one of these tokens, which gives you a second VP. And these can be lost if someone goes ahead of you on the track, but usually once you have it, you're pretty safe. But what's annoying about these faction spaces is that they provide diminishing returns. Because, you know, after you've got this token, what happens when you move up again? Nothing. And there's still a couple of spaces to move up, another four and you get nothing. And this creates, you know, situations where someone's two or three ahead of you and they've got this token, forget it. Don't even bother going to that faction anymore. And there's this annoying feedback loop where say I want to go to this faction and exile a card to make my deck better and myself stronger. That's what I want to do. But I've already got everything I can get with that faction. If I go to this faction, I don't want to do this action, it kind of sucks, but I don't have any influence with that faction. So there's two VPs I could potentially get. So if I go here to do an action I don't want to do, it's better for me to get VP, and this game is a race to get VP. So you end up, towards the end of the game, doing a lot of actions you don't want to do and not playing how you want to play in the chase for VP because you want to win. However, all of the spaces are interesting somewhat. The high number of different spaces and Imperium cards provides a lot of different routes to victory. But on the face of it, you think that the only way to get there would be through combat. I've had games where I've ignored combat and also had games where I've gone all out war. One thing that we haven't talked about yet are the Intrigue cards, which are a terrific addition to the game. These are secret little cards that you pick up from different places and provide a wide range of effects. They might let you move up one space on the influence track, let you add value to your combat, and they might even let you buy VP in some kind of manner. We like how different they all are, and what you draw could influence your strategy. In one game, Farrell drew an endgame scoring card in his first turn, 
which promised him two VPs if he fulfilled certain conditions. So he spent the entire game focusing on that. On the other hand though, because these intrigue cards are so interesting and varied, there becomes a bit of a gulf in difference between, not their usefulness, but you could say how fair they are. Because if I draw one that gives me three points in combat, that's kind of a very low bonus. But if Tally draws one that lets her buy a VP, then you can quite clearly see there's a gulf in difference between those two and how uh, valuable they are, let's say. And in a similar vein, a lot of the leaders, you know, they're, they're all different, but some are much more preferable to play as than others. And the actions or the bonuses they give you definitely are not equal. I've had games with some leaders where I've used their powers exactly once, and I've had other games where I've used their powers pretty much every single chance I got. And it seems to be that the problem is, Dune Imperium expects you to play to your leader's strength, but it's not possible in a game like Dune Imperium because you have to play in the moment and reactively. Coming on to the theme of Dune Imperium, it's pretty faithful to the Dune series of books, albeit in an abstract way. So if you're a fan of the Dune series, you'll be able to appreciate what Dune Imperium has. However, we really want to stress that if you know nothing about Dune or don't care or whatever, this is still a game you can play and enjoy and have a solid crack at. The rulebook also gives some background information and kind of describes the factions and why they have the actions they have if you're interested and that can get you up to speed as well. But at its core, it's just a really great game with a really great mashup of genres. You know, if you enjoy deck building and worker placement, then you should give this a go. Hello everyone and welcome to another Tally's Corner where I'm going to summarise my thoughts on Dune Imperium. Now I'll be honest, when I first played it, wasn't such a great fan. I thought it was a bit boring, not very interesting. I typically shy away from combat, but then after a few games, I realized there's a lot more to it. I started getting more intrigue cards, it made it a lot more interesting, and I realized it was not all about the combat. Also the combat, not very stressful. It is just a case of putting some cubes into a battle, and if they go, they go, you can always get some more. So actually, ended up really loving it, a lot more going on. Big thumbs up from Tally. In summary, there's a lot to like about Dune Imperium. It has some pretty good deck building mixed with classic worker placement, and it's brought out the best in both. The cards also provide a lot of interesting dilemmas, and generally they're just pretty cool. We like the intrigue cards, we like the Imperium cards. You know, it's not that complex, turn, turn. <laughs> it's not that complex a game either, so it's friendly to a wide range of people comes with a terrific theme, supported by decades of lore. Yet Dune Imperium doesn't require you to know one thing about it before you sit down and play. And most importantly, have a great time. If you don't like direct combat, however, and deception, you might want to turn to Lost Ruins of Arnak for a similar but more friendly experience. We also recently filmed a playthrough of Dune Imperium, which should be coming up mm -hmm. now. So have a watch if you want to see the game in action. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe to our channel if you didn't already for regular board game reviews, always with a little hint of doggo. Bye-bye.